I want to share with you one of the uh, most difficult years, in fact, it was about a year and a half in my life. I'm going to take you back to 1985 and 1986. Yeah, a long time ago. The youth are going, oh, did people exist back then? Yeah, your pastor did. I was, uh, I had just gone to the second church I served, and it was just outside of Lexington, Kentucky, uh, in a town called Harrodsburg, and uh, we were a little bit north of town, kind of heading back towards Lexington and between Lawrenceburg, and so it was an er area that was uh, rural, but was turning suburban with all the growth out of, out of Lexington. So it was a great opportunity to minister. Church in Elliott really needed a revival, really needed to grow, and we were blessed that uh, we came in August, moved in the summertime like lots of pastors do, and my wife and I and our one-year-old uh, daughter moved there, <clears throat> and uh, the church had said, well, let's don't do your insurance just yet. We want to uh, meet with Guidestone and see what we should do for you, how best to do this. So we waited for that meeting. Well, in the meantime, we find out we're pregnant with a second child. So now there is the threat that we're not going to have any insurance coverage. Attack number one was financial, that we may not have insurance for the birth of our second child. So anyway, that's how our ministry there started out. Well, I, uh, you know your pastor loves reaching people for Christ, and I uh, wanted to have an outreach time. And so we planned a revival, and uh, some of the deacons were like, Pastor, why don't you preach it yourself? Don't, get, don't bring in an evangelist, you do it. Um, so I preached, and we had 20-some people except Christ. We had several other people that made other decisions, and right away we saw church attendance start going up, starting to grow. So things were going great. Well, in central Kentucky, I had severe allergy problems, worse just, you know, more than I'd ever had before. Having trouble with that. Trying to get adjusted. Can I get something that will help me? On and on. Next month, I had scarlatina. Well, if you don't know what scarlatina is, it is strep throat with a rash. And my children had it, I had it. So, no big deal. You get over that, right? So, the next month, it's now December. And I find out that I have pneumonia. I was feeling really bad, drawn down. Now, remember, I've been an athlete my whole life. I've never been sick. I'm 25, and all of a sudden, I'm sick, and I'm really sick. <clears throat> the next month, I go back to seminary at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, about an 80, 90-mile drive, and I'm going to school, and I get worse. And now, my joints are really hurting. Uh, my knees, my ankles, my feet, elbows, hands, and I have all this stiffness. I go to a specialist in Louisville to uh, see someone at the Baptist Hospital there that was recommended to me, and I find out I am diagnosed with rheumatic fever. Now, rheumatic fever is where your heart becomes enlarged, and lots of people develop rheumatoid arthritis out of it. Well, I... I'm 25 years old, never been unhealthy, and all of a sudden, all my knuckles are swollen, my wrist, my elbows, my knees, my feet, and every night, I'm still going to school, still pastoring. Church is going great, but my physical health is really deteriorated. Every night, I curl up literally into a, fe uh, a fetal position, and it gave me much comfort, I suppose. But every morning, I would have to find a way to get to stretch out from that. It would take me 30 to 45 minutes just to be able to stand up erect and start walking. I couldn't walk at first. And that went on for months. So, as time passes, about six months, they had me doing all this, all these sweating things, hot baths, trying to get the, uh, you know, just the poison out of my system, and they kept treating me with some very strong medication, 
And about six months later, I start getting some relief, although it took about 18 months before it finally all went away. So I've never been sick. In the meantime, things at the church are going great. I only miss one Sunday preaching. And man, the deacons and other people were so helpful in just visiting people and helping me to just be able to kind of cope with this. So we go to Kemma's 10th reunion, her 10-year high school reunion back in West Virginia. And so we uh, go back, and we notice our daughter is just really, really, uh, just, she's just not feeling well, uh, very lethargic. And while we're there, we realize she's not eating anything. She's quit eating. And then we realize she's not drinking anything. If she is drinking something with her bottles and stuff, um, she's not, you know, doing anything with that. So we, we take her to the ER. The nurse, the nurse comes back and says, the doctor wants to talk to you. So please come on in here, back in here, and we're bringing her, your daughter back from the test. So we go in, and our little two-year-old Brittany is laying there, pale as can be, and we noticed there was no urine in, in, a, in a diaper either. So here, here, here we are, and the doctor comes in and she said, I don't want to overly alarm you, but your daughter is really, really sick. I don't know what's wrong with her. We need to get her to a better hospital. Can we fly you right now to Huntington, Charleston, or to Lexington? And we would prefer Lexington. And I said, well, we would prefer Lexington. I, I pastor a church. I, we live there. We live just 30 minutes away. So that would be perfect. So they start to get a helicopter, and then the weather is so bad with storms, they cannot do that. So God does something wonderful. I'll tell you that at the end of this story. So we get in an ambulance and drive, which is normally three and a half hours to Lexington from our little hometown of Williamson, West Virginia, and we're driving, and the ambulance driver is going 90 to 105 all the way there. I'm behind him, and I'm Mario Andretti, trying to catch up and just stay, stay behind him. So <clears throat> we get down there, and we get to Lexington in two hours. Carved off an hour and a half on the trip. We get down there, and... Things that happen there are just incredible. She, we, we go in, get her checked in. The doctors come and meet with us, and they said, listen, we've got some very serious new, news for you, and we've got to act quickly. Listen, your daughter, we only see five or six cases a year of this. That's how rare it is. Your daughter has hemolytic uremic syndrome. We're going... What? That's something about blood. We, know, we heard the blood word. So they start explaining to us that she has eaten, she's probably had some bad tainted meat. And sure enough, we had had, we had people that had cattle, uh, and they would occasionally, you know, kill, kill a, a steer or a, uh, and, and they would give us meat. And our daughter was affected by that. It did not affect Kim and I. The meat was obviously tainted. And, you know, who knew? You know, that's just what happened. So for 10 days, they told us, they said, we've got to make her stomach cavity and do what's called peritoneal dialysis. And we'll have to use her stomach cavity. She's too little to do dialysis with her bloodstream. So we have to purify, we have to flush out, we have to use her stomach cavity as a place to clean her blood. So we're going to, we have to do surgery right, right away. So I come to this circle, and now we've got both our families there, and I come to pray over my daughter. Now, I'm 25, I've been a pastor for four years, and I was a youth pastor even before that. So I do what I do. I, I went to pray. And when I tried to pray, I ju it just came out like this. Uh, uh, I could not get a word out. 
Maybe you've hurt so bad and been so shocked you've experienced that. Anyway, for 10 days, my daughter's kidneys did not work. Peritoneal dialysis, uh, uh, God used that to clean her blood. And on day 10, I had run back to Harrodsburg to pick up some clothes and stuff. And Kimma uh, calls me while I'm at the uh, parsonage, the pastorium by the church. She calls me and she's laughing and she's crying. And she says, <laughs> she just peed all over me. And she's so happy about it. Usually you're not happy when your kid does that, right? Well, when your kid hasn't done that for 10 days, you're thrilled to death. And her kidneys start working. And to this day, four, she's 40 years old now, her kidneys work just fine. They left all the equipment in there for two or three months just to make sure. And I kept getting better. And where I had less and less issues with my health, found out my heart's just fine. Uh, because I was an athlete, I had an enlarged heart anyway. So my vows were okay and uh, have been all, all these years. And I just want to tell you something. At the end of that week, uh, I had somebody come see me that was a deacon at our church. And he said, brother, I came when nobody else, I wanted to be with you when nobody else is here because I think God wants me to tell you something. He said, I, I think I'm supposed to kind of help you get accountable. And I'm like, yeah. He said, yeah. He said, the church is growing like crazy, more than I've ever seen it. He said, things are going great at the church, and there's an anointing on your life, there's no doubt. But man, your personal life is the pits. You have been sick. Now this, this with your daughter, hopefully she lives, she comes out of this. Because they told us the next thing's the heart to go. I want to tell you something. It was grueling, but we saw the hand of God in several places. And that brother told me, he said, you sure there's not some sin, unconfessed sin in your life? And I'm th I, I just told him, I said, you think I haven't already done that survey in my own heart with God many, many times? So he didn't say anything else. We just left it there. He's in the ministry now, by the way, which I think is so cool. <laughs> Uh, he's a pastor himself or has been all these years. So I just share that story because, you know, that was kind of like the end of the rough time. Our, our daughter got better, never had a problem. I kept getting better. Church kept going great guns. We built a new sanctuary there, turned the old building into a three-story educational building. Just had tremendous ministry there. And the church almost tripled in size during those uh, just four and a half years that I was there while I was in seminary before we moved to Florida. So anyway, I share that story to share this. If I could go back and skip 1985 and half of 1986, I would not. Because I learned some incredible lessons from God during that time. And I want to share with you that Job has his friends, and we've been in this series, When All Hell Comes Against You. Job had a hundred times worse than what I had that, that year, year and a half. Kim had told me between services today, she said, you act like that's the only bad and rough time we've ever had in, in life and in ministry. And I said, well, to me, it's still the worst one. She says, I, I, I think some others were worse. So anyway, we'll, we'll debate that after. Well, that'll be our lunch topic. So I want to talk to you about there's still hope at the end of your rope. And I've got some hiking rope here uh, that I'm going to use a little later in the message because, you know, in life you have so much rope to kind of get by with in this life. And sometimes we feel like we reach the end of the rope, and then we just don't have anything else to hold on to. Well, I'm going to challenge that today because there is still hope at the end of your rope. And I want you to look with me at the scriptures. Job's friends, well, at least two of them, Eliphaz and Bildad, have gone a second round with Job and basically conclude something you really need to hear. And here's what it is. Um, they conclude that since he is so hard-headed and keeps insisting he hasn't done anything wrong, that they're going, they conclude 
you know what, Job? You deserve everything that's happened to you. You deserve to be punished by Almighty God because you won't even come clean that you're a sinner and God is holding things against you and that's why you've got these troubles. Job, at the end of that time, with Eliphaz and Bildad blitzing him again, round two. Bil, uh, Zophar hasn't even spoken up yet. Uh, you'll see that in the 20s, when we're in chapter 20s, the early 20s. But, but Job prays this prayer at the beginning of chapter 17. He says, my spirit is broken. Man, just think, he's lost 10 kids, he's lost his career, he lost everything he had. His wife's still there, but she's not supportive. She says, curse God and die. Then he's got his friends show up. He's got boils and sores all over his body. And listen to what he prays. My spirit is broken. My days are cut short. The grave awaits me. Surely mockers surround me. My eyes must dwell on their hostility. So I don't even have the love and care of my friends. All they're doing is challenging me that what I say about life is not true. So we see this going on, and then Job swells up. His faith rises up inside of him. And in Job chapter 19, I preached on this passage, Easter. And we saw several people. We had one uh, make a profession this morning and is going to be baptized from Easter Sunday that was saved then. Uh, Job makes three statements, and I want to point these out. These are faith statements. They are not the things that he's been saying before because everything has been, I want my day in court with God. I want to justify myself. I have not sinned. I am not guilty of any wrongdoing here. And he keeps saying that. Now his tune changes. He switches to a proclamation, to a prophetic word that is said, being that this may be the oldest story in our Bible, he's definitely a con contemporary of Abraham, uh, or I, I believe that that's the case. Some have put him in the, in the poetic books with, with Solomon there, and maybe that story played out then, but we won't go back there. Look at this. He says, and all three of these statements about hope start with the, with the uh, self-proclamation, I. I. Listen to what he says. Let's uh, read these together. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives. I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I want you to read the passage in its entire context with me for just a moment. Here it is, Job 19, verse 25 to 27. He says, I know. He's emphatic about it. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet I, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Father, bless not just the reading of your word, but now going into this, this passage. Lord, may I deal with it in such a way that your Holy Spirit could illuminate hearts and minds. And today we're not talking about evangelism, although if that happens, praise you, Lord. We'd love to see somebody respond to the gospel in this service or online. But Father, we're talking about us as Christians getting through the difficult seasons of life like Job had, where we are bombarded with things that are not what we want, but help us to be faithful in the midst of that. And we just ask, uh, Lord, much like we, Kim and I had this year, year and a half in 85, 86, we just pray, Father, that, uh, that some of those lessons may just leap out today that we learned through that time. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you got an outline, a handout, I know that you on at home don't. Uh, or if you're listening in your car right now of our live stream, I just want to call your attention to something that's really important. Fill in this first blank, and that is this. Job tells us that he has hope in his Redeemer. 
Now, a redeemer is a person, it's the Hebrew word goel, and goel is a very interesting word because a redeemer or kinsman redeemer, it was your nearest male relative that uh, you had in your family. And believe me, back in that day, you really needed a kinsman redeemer, especially if you were a female and difficulties started coming your way. Look at this. It refers to that person's nearest male relative. So what could a redeemer do? Well, we covered this back in the spring, but it's worth repeating because we just want to touch on these things. What could they do? Well, according to Jewish law, a redeemer could buy back a relative's lost property. Let's say a husband dies in their family and they lose that property, that woman was not able to keep that property, this kinsman redeemer, this closest male relative could go and make that right and get that property back uh, to you. And you'll find that principle in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23 down to verse 25. A kinsman redeemer also, second of all, could avenge a slain relative by killing someone, killing the murderer. There were these cities of refuge, you may remember in the life of Israel, where if there was, a, uh, there was an accidental death or there was, uh, the, they were, these were the places these things would play out, uh, a, a redeemer could avenge that slain relative by killing that murder. It was justified in the, the law. Number three, a redeemer could purchase a family member out of slavery. Often, especially if they were women, they could be put in slavery if that male figure died in their family. That's something that for them to live and have a way to get by, that sometimes would happen and he could purchase them out of slavery. Four, a redeemer could defend a relative in a court hearing, much like we have a lawyer do that for us today, where somebody stands up for you. Maybe you hire them and they take up your case. A kinsman redeemer could do that where they could stand up for you. And also look at this last thing. A kinsman redeemer could marry if uh, this woman had been widowed and she did not bear a child. The kinsman redeemer could marry her and produce children. So that was also, and how many remember a story like that in the Bible? Anybody remember a story? I think our ladies have been studying that topic. They just finished a study on the book of Ruth. That's right. <laughs> Some of them are looking at me going, Ruth. Yeah, that story plays out. And the story of a kinsman redeemer. A redeemer was just a vindicator of unjustly uh, wrongs that had taken place against people. So Job says that in my scenario of my life, in some male application here in my life, in verse 25, he rises up. He's not talking about justice. He's not having, talking about having his day in court with God. He knows he's not guilty of, of any wrongdoing. Now he rises up and this faith is rising up in him and he says, I know my Redeemer lives. Do you know everybody in this room needs a Redeemer? The Bible makes it clear that our kinsman Redeemer is God's own Son, Jesus Christ, and He sure can become your closest relative. Amen? Amen. He can become your closest male relative. He's the one that can get you out of the mess that your life is in called S-I-N and death waiting for you after this life and hell after that. Jesus, if you will believe on him, he can be that kinsman redeemer that gets you out of the troubles that you have in this lifetime. And somebody ought to get excited about that and say amen. But he's going to go prophetic on us here and say a few other things. So he says, I know my Redeemer lives, and, in, and he will stand upon the earth. Now, that's a statement, and we're going to look at another statement that will add to that that tells us a little more. The Bible tells us that with faith, that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what what? We don't see. That's the reason it's faith. This is not walking by sight. This is walking by what? Faith. 
It's believing the good word of God. It's believing by what God has communicated to us that that is waiting for us even when we don't see it. Titus chapter 2 verse 13. You may remember that passage. It says these words. It says, while we wait for the blessed hope. Remember that? We've been talking about hope today. There is still hope at the end of your rope. Amen? Listen to this. Here we, here we go. We're going to talk about it. Check this out. He goes on to say, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This boy sitting here preaching, standing here preaching to you today, I got hope. My hope is in Jesus. My hope is unfailing. He's been faithful to, my, to me and my life all the days of my life. Not only has he been faithful to me, I've watched him be faithful to so many others. I have been a pastor for 44 years, and I share that to tell you that I have watched God be faithful over and over and over and over and over again to his people. He just is such a blessing in just that way. It's been said that man can live without uh, food for 40 days. I do know that's a fact because I've done that three times and had incredible experiences in those three 40-day fasts. I can also share with you that it's been said that you can go without water for about three days, that you can be without air for eight minutes, but you can only live one second without hope. That's a great statement. It takes hope to get by. You may remember my message at Easter was that the only way to cope is hope, right? So today we're talking about the way that we as Christians get by with the difficulties and hardships of life. So today we're talking about the, the, the truth of God's Word that tells us there is still hope at the end of the rope, right? When you're at the end of the rope, there's still hope because there's God. Watch this. Second of all, he says, Job also had hope. Where else was his hope in? His hope was in the resurrection. Fill that in if you're, if you're doing a, a handout today. The resurrection. Now Job goes prophetic. Job tells us that God is going to be alive. What did it say in verse 25? He said that he knows that his Redeemer, what? Lives. He's not dead, he's alive. And he knows that in the end, he's going to stand where? On the earth. Now he goes in a prophetic sense of talking about his own personal life. Look at verse 26. Job says that after my skin has been destroyed. Well, that's the, process, that's the process of the body decaying, right? You're down to bones, right? If your skin is destroyed in the uh, deterioration process that we go through when we die, he's talking about I, even after death, listen to this prophetic word he gives all the way back in perhaps the oldest story in the Bible. He says, after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, this is all a faith statement. He's telling you about his future. He says, yet in my flesh, I will see God. Man, this is getting happy right here because this is talking about your ultimate foe of death taking you out, that God, because of the hope we have in Christ, there is hope for your resurrection, not just his. Now, we already know Jesus got up, right? You have heard that, right? Now, I get, I get a little crazy with that around Easter time, right? Where you hear me say, he got up, right? Jesus did get up, and he's wanting to get up in your life right now. He's wanting you to give him the reins, and you get through the difficulties, the hardship, like Job, like 1985 and 1986 for us, that you get past those things. And, you know... One of the things I didn't tell you is God just does some cool stuff when you're hurting. And even though Job felt like God wasn't listening, he wasn't responding, God often does in very quiet and still ways. The ambulance we rode in to Lexington from Williamson, West Virginia, three and a half hour drive, two hours that day. 
the young lady that was the nurse in the ambulance was out of our home church that I was her youth pastor. six, seven years before. She rode all the way down there with us. One of my kids in the youth group, guys, she was now a nurse, and she's in the van. She knows us well, and she's taking care of our little girl until we can get to the hospital. I pull up at the hospital, and we're going in the emergency entrance, and another grace of God. Our organist, because this was on a Sunday, our organist had left, left church, and Sunday morning when we got there, she was standing, just like the presence of God. She's standing outside the emergency entrance, waiting for us because we had our baby daughter, Jordan, the pregnancy that we thought we wouldn't have covered. By the way, it was covered because we had not officially gotten diagnosed yet, so they still covered it. We didn't have financial difficulty from that. So Joyce is there, our organist from the church, and she says, I got Jordan, our daughter, our second oldest. She said, don't worry about a thing. I'll take care of her. And she grabbed our little bundle and took her while we took care of going with Brittany. That afternoon when church was over, some of the people came to the room from our church, and they said, Pastor, you got to come down to the waiting room. I walked down to the waiting room, and there were over a hundred people from our church, 30 miles away, that had driven to be with us and see us through that time. God's graces and touches are all through even our hardships, and you got to look, and you got to listen, and you got to watch to see them. And those things played out as little grace points. But I just want to go back to the story of Job here with you and share this, because Job is doing something really, really wonderful. He tells you that he has hope in the resurrection. Look at verse 26. He says, after my skin has been destroyed, this boy's dead. He's talking about after I pass from this life and I decay, I know something's going to happen for me. Because of my faith in God, and we know this through very clearly the gospel of Jesus Christ, that not only did Jesus come back to life, our Redeemer, our kinsman Redeemer, the Son of the living God came back to life and rose and is waiting to come back and get all of us. We know that He is going to stand on the earth in the last days. We know that we will see Him with our own eyes. Job prophesies that I personally am going to experience a resurrection too. Death is not the end of this boy. I'm alive. I'm coming back to life. God says so. I will stand and I will see him in my flesh. I will see God. Isn't that amazing? Job goes prophetic. He says, I'm going to live again and I will not only see my Redeemer, I'm going to see him in my flesh. I'm going to be resurrected as well. Man, that was some fun back at Easter, wasn't it? See, his hope is in this redemption that's coming. He doesn't know what's going to happen right now, but he rises up and his faith spouts out these truths of God prophetically, and God says that he has hope in his redemption. You remember reading that passage? We talked about Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 and how both of those passages, uh, they really probably need to go together, but the scribe divided it right there, and it says, these words, why are you so downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Is that always the answer to our lack of hope? It is, isn't it? Put your faith in God because he is your Savior and your God. That's the facts, Jack. Somebody better get on it right now because we're talking about great truth. We're talking about you being resurrected. Death can't hold you because Jesus conquered death. Sin can't hold you because Jesus conquered sin. Your kinsman redeemer rose from the dead. So are you going to rise from the dead 
and you ought to be shouting and glorifying about that, and somebody ought to say amen, clap, or something in here. That should be happening. Look at this third reality. There's a third reality here, and he says that he also had Job has his hope in this personal revelation. I want you to look at this personal revelation God gives to Job. Job says this hope is very personal. Christ is my kingsman redeemer. I'm in a mess. I got troubles. I've had all 10 of my children die. I, I am sick in my body. I've lost all my, my vocation. I I have lost all my cattle, all my career, it's gone, and I will simply tell you I still know that my Redeemer lives. I know that He's going to stand upon the earth. I know that I am going to see Him in my flesh and see my God. And he makes that profession. Go to 1 Peter chapter uh, 1, verse 3 and 4. It says these incredible words. He says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy He's given us a new birth. Listen to the language again. A new birth into a living hope. See, if you don't have hope, you cannot cope. That's why there are so many today you know, we have never seen a suicide rate in the United States like we're seeing these days. You heard one of our youth give a testimony just a, a handful of weeks ago and get up and share with you that at 12 years old, she tried to take her life. And she said she was unsuccessful, praise God, right? And she gave her heart to Jesus that next week right here at our church in our youth ministry. I, I share that because there's so many people living out here without hope. And if you're here today without hope, don't you leave until we see God give you a big old dose of hope, right? You need to come to the truth that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and he can change your life. Listen to this. He tells him in that passage, he says that this inheritance that we have, this new living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade, and it's kept in heaven for you. One day you're going to inherit all that God has for you. One, one day you'll step out of time into eternity. You'll step into heaven out of this life, and everything that God has for you will be given to you as you step into heaven, and you will be, it's incredible. We will, we will have our full minds Man, we've been walking around with using 6, 8, 10 percent. They tell us that some of these folks that are maybe our genius status may be using 12. Can you imagine having full brain capacity, never forgetting anybody? You know everybody because there's nobody that's a stranger in, in heaven. And then you have this perfect body and all that goes with it. You see, this hope is so profitable. In Romans chapter 8, verse 24, 25, it says this, For in this hope we were saved. But in this hope that is, it is not hope that is, uh, uh, he says, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. You see, it's always the projection of what's out there in the future to the truth of God's Word, right? You don't have it yet. You just are striving for that, and you have the hope that that is given to you because God says so. Who hope for what he already has. But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. O.S. Marden made this statement. He says, there's no medicine like hope. There isn't any medicine like hope, is there? There's no incentive so great, no tonic so powerful as the ex expectation of something better tomorrow. Listen, with God, it's all better tomorrow. Amen? Listen, you're going to heaven forever and ever where there are no more tears. They've been wiped away, and you are made perfect, and you will live forever. I tell you what, that's a really good deal. Amen? It is. But he tells us there's a better tomorrow. Listen, Martin Luther said this back in the Reformation. He says, everything that is done in the world is really done by hope. You have to hope that it exists or it could exist, right? Or you believe that. The Bible tells us, be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. I want to tell you a story and leave you with this. Steve Lawson wrote an incredible book on Job. 
In fact, uh, I called my series, When All Hell Comes Against You, and his title is a little different. It's the best book I've ever read on, on Job. In fact, uh, I am reading it right now, going through this series and a couple other books on Job, uh, just as, as feeding my own heart and mind. Uh, and I let somebody borrow them my book, Steve Lawson's book, and that I didn't get it back. Mm. Oh, man. And that is my absolute favorite book on Job. So I, I bought it a couple months ago when we were preparing to do this series. And I'm rereading it now for either the third or fourth time. Uh, it's just such a great book. Steve Lawson tells a story about coming to Dallas. I want you to hear this. He was ministering in Little Rock, Arkansas then. So he, he and his family were coming to Dallas, and his mother-in-law was very sick with cancer. She was here getting treatment, and then they were going to give her a report of what, where she was. So he has his wife and his two little twin boys. He also had just bought a, uh, a hybrid car that was a Chevrolet. And he had bought that thinking that, you know, maybe he'd get better gas mileage making visits and stuff with people and, and all the travel he did. So he bought a hybrid car when they first came out. And they were having some problems with it, but they took it anyway. So they drove to Dallas, and then they drove it electrically for a while out of Dallas. And then they're up on I-30, and uh, he's now back on gas because he's out of battery life. So he's back on the gas part of the engine, and the car starts knocking and pinging like something's going on with the engine. He looks in his rearview mirror, and he sees gray and blue smoke coming out of the back of his car. And the problem was this was Saturday night at midnight between Texarkana and Little Rock on I-30. That's a lonely, lonely stretch of road. And he said that he knew they weren't near any exits. They, who's going to work on a hybrid car? They just invented these. Who's going to, who could do that? And he said he hears metal on metal under the hood. And then the gauges all jump up and down and it goes dead. He said, now I'm coasting and I got lights, but I know that's only going to last for a while. So we're coasting. He's thinking in his head, what will I do? Do I leave my wife and two little boys here? And what if something happened to them? I'll never get over that. Uh, maybe I take them with me. I'll carry the boys and I'll, I'll walk with them until we find an exit and get somebody to help us. And I know this car, it's really messed up. And who in the world can work on a hybrid car on the road like this? He gets over a little knoll and then starts going downhill a little bit. And he's able to ride this out. The car's going slower and slower. And then all of a sudden, he sees lights on the horizon. And he sees a sign with one word on it, H-O-P-E, hope. He rolls off the exit ramp. And lo and behold, there is a gas station open. On the other side of the highway is a Holiday Inn, and beside the Holiday Inn is a Chevrolet dealership. <laughs> Closed, obviously. But he's like, maybe they can do something with my car, this hybrid Chevrolet we have that has blown up or something. That exit was Hope, Arkansas, by the way. And I want you to know something. It doesn't matter if gray and blue smoke is blowing out the backside of your life. It doesn't matter if the parts of your life are all falling in the road and you just feel like, man, I am stuck, stuck, stuck. It doesn't matter if you break down in every way in life, in your health, in your family life, all the rest. I'm here to tell you that when that takes place, and you think you're at the end of your rope, like I'm at the end of this rope, there is always hope. Amen. I don't care who you are, there's always hope at the end of your rope. 
You know why there's hope at the end of your rope? Because there's always God. You got it? Enough said. Go out and live this. That's all I got to say.